Every once in a while, I experience what I can only describe as a book hot flash. You know, you're just wandering around, going about your life, and all of a sudden you're like, I really want to reread X. And it's just like your biological clock is like, nope, you need the story and you need it right now. And there's usually no reason it gets triggered. Well, for a while now, my inner reader has been screaming at me to reread his dark materials. Fuck these books. Just, I want to bow down to the sacred His Dark Materials. I want to cuddle it like it's my favorite stuffed animal. I want to put it up on a shelf and just stare at it lovingly for hours. I forgot just how good this series was. Rereading this series has been one of the best decisions I have ever made. All the things that I forgot about it, all the hidden meanings that I didn't get as a kid, I must have been about 11 or 12 when I first read this series, and just the ways that it has shaped my inner psyche. It's like running into an old friend that you haven't seen for a very, very long time and realizing that no time has actually passed. It's so good and comforting, but enough about us. This is our review, as best as we can, on The Golden Compass. The Golden Compass begins when we meet Lyra, doing what she's not supposed to be doing, sneaking into a room she's not supposed to be in, in the college where she lives, witnessing the master of the college trying to poison her uncle, Lord Asriel. She stops the murder and ends up overhearing their conversation that hints at the politics and science that is causing such an uproar in the world. Dust is falling from the sky, and the church is freaking out, and not your usual house dust either. This dust is an elementary particle that is attracted to humans, mainly adults, and only affects children after they've hit puberty. Lord Asriel convinces the college to give him more money, even though the church isn't happy with his research, and goes on his way. Lyra is left in Oxford, where a group only known as the Gobblers are kidnapping children. A friend of hers is kidnapped and Lyra vows to rescue him. Her life is derailed, though, when a sophisticated woman named Mrs. Coulter takes her on as an assistant. Lyra learns that this woman is one of the people involved in the kidnapping ring and runs away, finding friends to help her rescue the stolen children who have been taken to the north. But Lyra's world is not like our own. It almost has a steampunk feel where some things are more advanced than in our world and other things are less advanced. Pullman does this very subtly in the book where he manages to pull off a very old but new world feel. He populates Oxford with the Egyptians, a boat people the equivalent to the gypsies, but also anabaric, aka electric light. Scholars belong to a college that uses a crypt and gas lamps, but there are also airships and fire hurlers. The other key difference is also the coolest. People have demons, a soul separate from their bodies that can speak and is strongly connected to their human. If a demon is killed, so is their human and vice versa. These demons exist with you from the moment you're born to the moment you die and cannot go far from you. As a child, your demon can change shapes, but when you hit puberty, it takes one fixed form. What is better than having your soul manifest as your spirit animal? You get to learn what type of person you are, and also have a lifelong companion. I mean, it's one of those things in fiction that you never forget. Who wouldn't want to live in that world? Lyra is also given a golden compass before she leaves the college and is told to keep it hidden, but this device isn't any old compass pointing to the magnetic north. This is an alethiometer, and it'll tell you the true answer no matter what you ask it, as long as you know how to read it. And it takes most people years and years to learn how to read it with the help of a book, but Lyra picks it up extremely fast. One thing to note about Pullman's writing style is that there isn't a lot of dialogue. I mean, there's enough dialogue that you don't constantly feel like you're being narrated at, but a lot of the character development comes from actions paired with adjectives. This creates this aura of an epic story. The adjectives gradually become absolutes, subtly reinforcing exactly how actions should be construed in a way that's artfully both showing and telling. Lyra is a fierce, half-wild little girl like you're unlikely to encounter anywhere else. She is intelligent, willful, charismatic, capable, and an amazing liar. She sets her mind on a lofty goal, but in this earnest, childlike way, she manages to achieve it. Pullman worked a miracle when he wrote this character. You never forget how young she is, but also how powerful she can be. You can't help but love Lyra, and there's no doubt in your mind why this little girl is the one with the giant destiny. The villains in this story are also unforgettable. Of course, some of what makes them complex and unforgettable happens later on in the series, but in The Golden Compass, oh my god, it's so easy to hate them. Miss Coulter is the main villain in book one. 
heading the gobblers who kidnap and experiment on children. She is absolutely terrifying. In the book, she masquerades as a sweet, charming, charismatic, high society lady, but she also has this incredibly cold, cruel, and manipulative side. Lyra, put it away now. I don't want to. <laughs> I love Nicole Kidman in this movie, but honestly, I don't think she was creepy enough. And her golden monkey demon. I want to punt that thing off a cliff so badly. But the best part is that Mrs. Coulter is Lyra's estranged mother, which not only gives her another level of creepiness, but also gives the story another level of epicness, like a throwback to fairy tales. Lord Asriel, Lyra's uncle, is another villain in a looser sense. He's described as being this powerful, dominating man who could take down God himself. Also, he's Lyra's father and only a slightly better parent than evil monkey lady over there. In the history of shitty parents, these two are some of the shittiest. Just two awful people who have no regard for their daughter, especially when she gets in the way of their ambitions. And as much as these two villains will keep your hair on end, you fall deeply in love with the other side characters. I do beg pardon? Lee Scoresby, and this old gal is Hester. Lee Scoresby, perfectly cast as Sam Elliott in the movie, the rangy Texan who flies an air balloon, Yorick Brynason, the armored bear. Seriously, a talking bear that walks around in armor and goes to war. And the glamorous witch, Serafina Pacala. Everything is so quietly wonderful that you barely notice when you fall for them, just like the Golden Compass itself. It's subtly epic and in the tradition of something like the Chronicles of Narnia or The Hobbit. Here's a story about a little girl who has an incredibly tiny worldview. She's never been out of her city before, but there is constant hints that this girl has a major destiny. Everyone who meets Lyra senses it, but to her, all she has is one goal of going north and rescuing her friend from evil people. But on her way to achieving this goal, Lyra gets wrapped up in all these major world events. She takes down the gobblers, who are actually a group run by the church, raises their facility to the ground, influences the kingship of armored bears, and then helps create a bridge to another world. All without even intending to. Because Lyra barely understands what's going on, but manages to do these things anyways, you get this grand sense of her destiny. Also adding to this novel's sense of grandeur is something that sets it apart from most YA and children's books. There are no other significant child characters in The Golden Compass. The characters that have a real effect on the plot are all adults. Then when you start to think, here are all these adults who knowingly or not depend on this fierce little girl to complete this giant destiny, it starts to blow your mind. Especially considering in most YA these days, the parents are absentee because their presence would obstruct the plot. But we would be remiss to talk about this series without mentioning that it is on a lot of banned book lists. If you missed the scandal when the Golden Compass movie came out, you might have missed it entirely, but his dark materials pissed off a lot of groups. There are a lot of religious themes running through these books, and some of them aren't as easy to miss as the Christian elements in the Chronicles of Narnia. Of the evil forces at work in Lyra's world is the Magisterium, an organization that was created after the Catholic Church dissolved. It's an influential organization and subsidizes the gobblers because the church sees dust as evidence of original sin. So the church is experimenting on children, permanently separating the children from their demons, aka their souls, just to get to the nature of original sin, because they want a group of pure, unquestioning followers. This has to be one of the most intense concepts I ever came across and even partially understood as a kid. Just the magnitude of the forces that this book is confronting. Organized religion. The evils that are committed in the name of religion all the time. The hypocrisy of people in power saying one thing and doing another. It was mind-boggling as a kid, and as an adult I have mad respect for it. It was like a philosophical essay broken down so a child could understand it, and I can't say that there are many of those around anymore. This was an instant classic from the moment it came out in 1992, and it's barely aged. It's one of those books where you reread it, and every time you come out with something new. There's so much here to appeal to different audiences as well. Fantasy with talking bears and demons, sci-fi with other worlds, an epic adventure embedded with philosophy. If you haven't read this series, you're really missing out. This has been a review of the first book of His Dark Materials, 
and we will be doing the other books in the series at some unspecified time during this year. So if you are excited, stay tuned because we will get to it. Eventually. eventually.